Welcome to Emotion Chips, where we talk about the real reason everything happens for a reason. I am your host, Charlie Carroll, along with my crisp co host, <laughs> Mallory Redmond. Mal, welcome I don't really to the know program. what that means, but I like it. You're crisp. What's that mean? That's your. Just let's okay, go let's with it. Let's just go with it. Yep, my crisp co host. Maybe I just like saying it on this crisp fall day it's so great outside yes it, it's i love fall what what a great time of year the last couple of nights we have had a chance to sit out by the bonfire uh, with a glass of wine and it's yeah, just nothing better magical yeah yes welcome to episode 34 is it really i think so nice thanks last time i said larry bird episode 33 oh, yes, so yes, i think yes. I think we're at episode right. 34. Yes, you're right. How are you feeling on this fine fall morning? I feel good. Oh, and singing. I feel really good. Now, we talked last, our last episode about sleep. Yes. I still haven't totally hacked it. Well, it's, it's a work in progress. It's a, prog- it's a lifelong journey. So For sure. I am a little bit faking it just because I didn't sleep like at all. And so I have to, in order to not let my exhaustion take over i i kind of fake some pep in my step yeah i get it yeah for sure yeah yep it's just that's how i that's how i hack it right now it's a work in progress yeah how are you but how are you no i'm doing well ready to talk about financing your future if you are an artist and you are trying to make the jump from that eight to five life Mm -hmm. Uh, to the eight to eight life as right. an entrepreneur, yep. uh, where you can support yourself. Uh, that's what we're going to talk about today. Nice. Uh, I, I get a chance to talk about that regularly and I've done it uh, and it's cool. You know, we say entrepreneurs are the people that work 80 hours a week so they don't have to work 40. Right. Uh, and there's a lot of truth to that because I don't feel like I ever work. I was, I was saying this to someone yesterday uh, that actually late last night, I was saying this to someone that I don't feel like I work. I mean, there's definitely my share of liabilities and hard times and mm-hmm. things that I'm not really keen on, but sure. But everybody has that. There, in yeah. But there's, there's something, I mean, if you had to ask me, when does something stop feeling like work? It's, it's when you're passionate about it. You know, what's funny is, um, I actually prefer weekdays to the weekend. Okay. I like the rhythm of my weekdays better. Sure. Because I like my work. Yeah. And there's, it's different on the weekends. And, and that's just it. I mean, to, to be able to get paid for what you love to do is an incredible privilege. Mm-hmm. Uh, last night was Taco Tuesday at Table 33. Yes. It started off slow, but okay. picked up. And that was wonderful. When I received a call, uh, actually a text from a parishioner that I did not catch immediately, uh, but then they called you, which was nice. Uh-huh. So I received the call. So actually. you received the call. Yeah. I received the text uh, that someone in uh, our community was headed toward the hospital with stroke-like symptoms. Mm-hmm. And so fortunately enough, I was able to meet them over there. And I got there just a couple of minutes behind uh, their arrival in the ambulance because they were nice. coming from uh, north of town. And obviously tables not far away from Miami Valley Hospital, and uh, I walked in and uh, got into the emergency room one with my clergy benefits. There's not a ton of them. Okay. But, but yeah, but there's one of them. Getting into the hospital, especially during a pandemic, mm-hmm. uh, there's a, a primary benefit. And so I... I Which, how do you utilize that? You have a card? Yeah, I've got a card. But side note. Okay. Uh, yesterday I was wearing a blazer or a sports jacket. Mm -hmm. And I was, I was saying to Amy that it really is amazing when you wear a sports jacket, just the different level of attention or response you get from people. Okay. Well, let's just press pause for one second. Go ahead. Because I don't think you're accurately representing your sport jacket. Yeah. You're not, you're not accurately representing it. Go on. Because it wasn't, it's not just like a blue blazer. Well, it definitely wasn't a blue blazer. It was, Um, it was, there was like a very loud pattern so of course you're gonna do you feel like it was loud it was semi-loud. i don't think it was it, it wasn't like it was uh, a navy I jacket with some pink and maroon 
flower floral patterns yeah. stitched into it. Yeah, I, it wasn't with, deafening or anything. With a little martini pin. Right. On the... Yeah, it was a nice jacket. I'm just top. saying, like, it's not just because you were wearing a jacket that it was turning heads. You, it was That was a jacket. True. All so, right. nevertheless, ahead. they didn't even ask me to pull out my credentials. They just let oh, me through. Okay. Good and to so, know. And so, I get into emergency bay number one, where they have my friend uh, that I've known now for several years. And he was manifesting all of the signs and symptoms of a, a full-blown stroke, uh, having trouble moving the right side of his body. And then the left side of his face was not under his control anymore. Mm. And so I walked in and the doctor on, on call uh, that was holding his hand said, who's this guy? Pointing to me, of course. And my friend said, um, you know, and he's struggling to, to get his words. He said, uh, Charlie, uh, and he didn't say it super clear, but he, he said, Charlie, this is my pizza. Pizza. Yeah, I was his pizza. He was trying to say pastor. Sure. But what came out was pizza. I was his pizza. Now, I've been a lot of things to a lot of people. Yeah. I don't know that I've ever been anyone's pizza. Check that one off the list. Yeah. And so the doctor smiled knowing that he was trying to say something. Yeah. And so a couple of, of, of minutes go by and... Uh, his wife asked if I would stay by his bedside while she went out and made some calls to family to give them an update. And um, w w when you're in a situation where you're uh, demonstrating the symptoms of a stroke, in a lot of cases, they'll give you something called TPA. And, and TPA is like a bunker buster for clots that, okay. it, that it dramatically, like radically thins your blood and there's a decent amount of risk with it uh, because it, in a lot of cases, you don't know if there's a, a brain bleed or there's a, a bleed in the gut. Mm -hmm. And so there can be some danger with TPA and they, they do an assessment in the ambulance on the way to the hospital to see if they can see through a scan any bleeding. And if they can't, they're going to give you TPA because your brain is being starved uh, of blood and oxygen. And that's why some of your facilities or, or your members are not working. And so they take a, a, an educated risk and give you this product called TPA that has about an eight to 10% chance of, of helping disrupt the wall or the clot that is preventing blood flow. And so they had, they had started him on a drip of TPA and we're just standing there and, uh, his wife goes out to make phone calls and, and the doctor leaves the room and there are two, uh, one doctor and one nurse in the room with me. And I just thought, you know, obviously we had a lot of people praying and, and put messages out to get people praying. And, yeah. uh, I was putting my hands on him, you know, just to, to have an opportunity to exchange energy and, and, and pray for him. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to try to keep him calm, you know, because I could tell that he was frustrated. Sure. And so I was, I was relatively close and just started, he, he was trying to ask me how the kids were. And so I was telling him about my children and the left side of his face, which I was on his left side, um, was not working. And so he, he turned his head so that he could use his right eye to look at me over on his left side, you know, standing on his left side. And it's a story I will tell the rest of my life. In just a moment's notice, it, it's as if, I don't know if your parents ever did this to you, but my grandpa would do this to us. He would rub or like wand his hand in front of our face and he would tell us to, to get a straight face. And then the challenge was when he put his hand in front of our face, he was going to make us smile and we needed to try to resist it. Mm -hmm. And and it was it was like that, almost as if somebody took like this magic wand in front of my friend's face. And literally, I, I mean, I was staring right in his eyes when this happened. Everything changed. I mean, literally everything changed. And he went back to normal just like this. And, and my only reaction in the moment is I just clicked my finger. And I was like, oh my gosh. And I, and I summoned the, the nurse and the doctor. So was it just you two in the room? Myself. And about eight feet away was a nurse and a doctor. I said, I just snapped my finger and I said, oh my gosh. I said, come look at this. He just changed. 
And they said, what? And I said, come look at this. He like, he's back. He just changed. And so they come running over to his bed and literally he has full control of his face again. He's moving all around and it, and it's, it's like you just woke someone up from a nap. Right. And, And they can't believe it. Uh, the one nurse starts crying. Uh, the, the other, the doctor in the room says, I'll be damned. <laughs> I just can't figure it out. And what was he doing? Your friend? Um, I mean, he knew that he had just been through something and could recall all of it. Like he, he basically, uh, I really quick picked up my phone and, and texted his wife and said, you need to get back in here. And so she comes running back in and, and, you know, she's, you know, beside herself. Sure. And, uh, she starts asking him questions like about the process because they had been at dinner with, with, with some friends. Yeah. Uh, and all of them started noticing his behavior that he just went flat. And, um, he, he recalls the whole thing. And so, um, sure enough, I mean, literally they keep calling different doctors to come in the the room and, and the things that they're saying, like, this is why, this is why we live to see these situations. And again, you know, I believe it was a miracle. Um, and, and, and I'm not taking anything away from TPA, but the statistic on TPA is, is eight to 10%, seven to 10% of the time it works, right? That it. Yeah. Well, it doesn't even sound like the medical professionals were thinking it was the TPA. Well, and, and that's really the point I was telling someone this morning, like, by their reaction where, where one of them started crying and then all of them were like, just, they kept calling other doctors to come in the room, uh, to see Mm -hmm. this. They're like, okay, raise your leg, raise your eyebrows, open your mouth, show me your tongue, you know, taking a flashlight going over his eyes. I mean, it, it, it's an absolute miracle. I I mean, it was wild. And so, we wait a little bit and go up, you know, they admitted him to just observe him mm-hmm. for a while, mm-hmm. uh, for a couple of days. And we, we go up to his room and we're just talking about all of these things. And his wife ran home to, to put a bag together and, and to come back. And so we're, we're talking and, uh, he said, you know, I, I'm thinking about starting a side hustle. <laughs> and I'm like, perfect. Uh, <laughs> in a lot of cases, your life you know, in, 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 I don't know, 90, 95% of the people that came in with what you came in with tonight, uh, your life would have been dramatically changed, but for sure, but not for the better. Right. Well, that's why it makes perfect sense that that's kind of where his head was at last night of like, okay, life is fragile. Yeah. What am I going to do with the rest of my days? Yeah. Just maybe I start a side hustle. Love it. And I think people think, you know, first of all, I, I don't want to move on from that story too fast. Like an absolute miracle. Miracles still happen. Yeah. Uh, for those of you that are wondering that the, the medical community calls them a spontaneous remission. They don't use the word miracle. So did they use that word, that phrase yesterday? No, they, the, the in the journals, the, the American Medical Association will say that there's nine thousand, six to 9,000 spontaneous remissions a year right? Which is a decent amount that, that are caught. Obviously there are a lot more that are, that are not captured, um, that are, that are miracles. And we don't use the word miracle because it seems less scientific. And that means there could be this invisible force for good, which who wants to be accountable to that or think about that? Is that a question you want me to respond? Okay. Not at all. (laughs) Uh, but, 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 but they happen. Yeah. And, and so even just getting back into, you know, when we've talked about prayer being a tool that God has given us to change realities, like don't ever stop praying or think that your prayers don't change things. Mm-hmm. I mean, in with, within 10 minutes of this happening to uh, our friend, I mean, there are probably conservatively a couple hundred people praying. Yeah, for, for sure. You know, what's so interesting. Thank goodness for you, because I feel very, um, I feel clearly too sensitive to people's privacy when things like this happen. Um, and I don't know, I'll have to think about why I am that way. Something must've happened in the past where I like 
somebody thought I overshared. Um, because last night when we found out all this was happening and you were about to leave and go to the hospital, you asked me to, to send a message out to a group of, of people yeah. like leaders in our community and let them know what was happening. And I hesitated because I was like, I don't really know them so well. Do you think that they'll be okay with us like sharing the story before they know the end of the story? And so you went ahead and did it and thank goodness, because that's how there were so many people that were aware and praying. Yeah. For him. Uh, yeah. And I, I think the truth of the matter is in a life or death situation, which this clearly was, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to err on the side of getting more people praying because I believe and know and have, have seen for myself the power in prayer versus worrying about what they're going to think about me and their privacy. Now, I shared it to a group of trusted people that we know and they know. Sure, we didn't blast it on right. Twitter or and, whatever. And, and then, um, I should read this actually, when I was there at their bedside, I asked his wife, uh, I said, are you okay with me uh, giving an update to this group of people? And she said, yes. And so I typed this and I'll read it to you. But then I showed it to her and said, are you okay with this? Will you approve this? And she said, sure. And then she asked me to send it to her so she could send it out. And the point is, if I have the opportunity to ask someone about their privacy, sure. I'll do that. If I don't, again, I'm going to get people praying more than I'm going to be worried about their response to my decision in regard to their well-being. Yeah. Uh, I said this person, and I use their name, was being treated for a full-blown uh, stroke when almost immediately something came over him and he slash everything was completely normal again. The doctors and nurses are blown away. They can't believe the recovery. One said, I'll be damned. Another said, this is what makes all we do worth it. Very moving. God was and is definitely here. On behalf of this couple... Thank you for your prayers. They will update you as soon as possible. So wild. Yeah, very wild. Just, I mean, and, and hopefully if you're listening to this podcast, it gives you hope that you can dive back into prayer and prayer changes things. So what do you say to the person who is maybe listening to this and it is only growing in them like anger or whatever that, their such and such wasn't healed, their significant other, their parent or them themselves, um, yeah. you know, because I think that can be so easily be where someone goes is like, well, that's cool. But w like people were praying for me. Sure. What, what why wasn't that worthy of yeah. something so miraculous? Yeah. Life doesn't happen in a vacuum. And, and what I mean by that is there are always so many things going on in one particular situation that you just don't know what could be hindering or uh, keeping something from happening. Um, and, and you know what, at the end of the day, we also need to acknowledge that just because things happen like this and there are people, thousands of people that will have strokes uh, today all across the world and they will be paralyzed and not regain control of their members. It doesn't mean that God approves of it. That, you know, that we live on a planet where bad things happen to all people to include good people. And uh, for whatever reason, God doesn't prevent everything, but he can redeem everything. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's painful when you get into, it can be painful when you get into entertaining the question like, why did God heal this person and not this person? But I think what we'll, we'll end up seeing is that, you know, I, I use the phrase that life doesn't happen in a vacuum, but th there's a passage in scripture that says, you know, choose this day who you will serve or uh, serve the Lord while the Lord can be found. And, and some of the hidden truth in those passages are, when you have an, a conviction or an awareness that God is near to you or directing you to do something, you need to follow that trail. Mm -hmm. you, you need to follow those, those breadcrumbs because he's trying to lead you somewhere today and there would be no power or effectiveness in God trying to lead us today if every day was that way, right? And so, you know, putting it into um, just... A, kind of more of a practical uh, situation, you know, as a coach, 
if I go to one of my players and say, hey, I have time today, or I've recognized that as a player, there are some things that you need to work on. Uh, let's work on these. Or maybe I write a, a list of drills out and say, here, this is what you need to do in order to bring up this part of your game in order for you to contribute to the team, which will help you in your overall sense of purpose, enjoy what you're doing. Mm -hmm. Well, as, as that person or as that player, I have a responsibility to take what this coach or guide who knows more than me, who's been around the sport more than me and who sees what I need to do. I have a responsibility to respond to the prompting. I have a responsibility to respond to that guidance. And in, in some ways we're encouraged throughout scripture to respond while, while that grace is there. Um, that if every opportunity was equal every minute of every day, it would not be an opportunity. Sure. Right. Yeah, and so true. in the same thing with our relationships, whether it's with each other or with God, there is an ebb and flow to life and to grace and to mercy that we need to respond to the opportunity when it's in front of us. Mm -hmm. and, and so uh, when I say that life doesn't happen in a vacuum, you know, you could, you could see a scenario where someone was raised in church. It wasn't a good experience. Maybe their parents professed to be, you know, godly people or following God, but that was more of a, a lip service than it was an actual reality. Mm -hmm. And so their children uh, maintained a level of distance between themselves and God because of the disappointment they saw via the behavior, maybe manipulation, what have you, of their parents when claiming to be close to this loving, caring, uh, knowing, directing God. And so they put distance between themselves and, and their parents, God. Mm -hmm. And so then they don't hear the voice and the instruction and their, their distance and proximity. And if God is not, you know, if, if God doesn't heal, but he is life and he, and like healing is a part of who he is versus something that he just does, the further away you position yourself from this source of life, uh, the more you might be affected by that lack of prompting or leading that could tell you to do this or not to do this. I'll, I'll use it in this story as a perfect example where we see God involved from the beginning. So the person that called you mm -hmm. is the person that text me. Mm -hmm. That couple had this couple, right? That, that experienced the stroke yep. over for dinner last night. Okay. The wife that was going to host the dinner that reached out to our friends that had the stroke yeah. said, Hey, I've had you guys on my mind uh, today. Do you want to do an impromptu dinner? And the wife said, yeah, we'll come over for dinner. So they go over to their house and it's while the four of them are sitting around the table that not just the wife, but also the other couple notice the, the unusual behavior mm -hmm. in our, our friend. And so the three of them worked together to call the squad and to get him basically help. Well, you know, last night around, I don't know, 11, um, as they're getting our friend out of the ER up to his room, I'm in, in the waiting room with the wife. And she says to me, she reads me a text from the couple that was over and from the wife that reached out to them in the first place. And the wife says, maybe you were on my heart because God knew this was going to happen and we needed to be there to help you. Yeah. And the wife of the stroke patient says to me, it is highly likely that my husband would have been out in the garage if it was just the two of us at home by ourselves and I might not have caught this yeah. until it was too late. Gosh, that gives me chills. And, and so what's the point in all of this? The point is just to make a face valuation or surface valuation as to why it happens to some people and not others. What I'm saying is that life doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are all of these outside factors that can affect big moments mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and, and prevent a miracle from happening. Mm-hmm. Now, of course, that's not true in every situation. Sure. You know, a couple episodes ago, we talked about friends of ours whose son, you know, had a tragic accident and went home at three. There's nothing that those parents could have done yeah. in that situation. And God has used that situation to share a lot of light, life and love, and they will be redeemed or, or reunited with their son in eternity mm-hmm. forever mm-hmm. is my belief. And so it, we just have to be true to um, the truth in being willing to really investigate some things and, and, and flush the thought completely out, like work it all the way out, knowing that we're not always going to know everything. Yeah about it. Yeah. And and so to the person who is, um, disappointed because their loved one, you know, has been confined to a bed or a a wheelchair, uh, because of a stroke, like I completely understand, um, why you would be upset. And, um, it's a very unpleasant, sad situation. And and I, I hope that we, uh, who, our friends of people that have experienced that can come beside them and give them the support that they need. Yeah. Yeah. I think some kind of a side note, um, that's related, but not completely just the, just the interconnectedness of us all. Um, like the couple who hosted the dinner, that's just, I didn't know that part of the story and that's pretty incredible. And I've had, I mean, it just, it's talks, it's energy, right? I mean, that's all that, we're talking about. And I've told you before, we've talked before about like when somebody kind of quote unquote randomly pops into your mind. Yeah. And there's so many times it was just a few weeks ago. I could not get this girl out of my head that I went to grad school with. Yeah. And I'm like, I got to reach out to her because I know enough now to know something was probably happening with her. Right. right? Because I'm, I get energy enough now and I didn't reach out to her. And then a couple days later, she announces on social media that she's pregnant and I'm like, Oh, of course. Like that's why I was thinking about her. Um, but it's just, that is such a, just as a side note, just like, it's so powerful to know, like when some, somebody pops in your mind, like it's happening for a reason Yeah. and there's something that we can do, even if it's just reaching out and saying, Hey, and seeing what, what they need. Yeah. And, and, And we're made and come from the same source of energy. And, and because of that, you can really tune into what's going on with other people. And if you can slow down and, and, and practice becoming more aware of that, you know, there, there's just so much that you can do with yeah. that in a positive way to serve other people. Yeah. You know, walking from, we went the back way, which is always the fun way, uh, from the emergency room up to, oh, yeah. up to his room. And one of the things that I, I thought about, and I just want to stop and say this for a moment, is the faces and the energy and the exhaustion that that was there for the doctors and nurses was unreal. Yeah, I can't imagine. Uh, just with the year that we've had with the pandemic, yeah. uh, thank you to all of the nurses and doctors and medical professional, professionals out there who are giving their life to take care of other people. I mean, just absolutely amazing. I mean not because of the amount of people, but because of, of the energy and just intensity there. I mean, it was like a war zone. Yeah. Which makes it all, I mean, just the timing of his recovery, all the more meaningful that they got for sure. Those particular doctors and nurses were able to experience that because I'm sure that there's a whole lot of death that they are faced with every single day. I'm going to ask for a favor from our listeners. Perfect. Uh, If you're listening to this and you know a medical professional, uh, doesn't matter who they are or or what area, uh, would you thank them? Just go out of your way to thank them for the work that they are doing. Just even a random little text Mm -hmm. just to say, hey, I know you don't get a lot of glory or, or people don't point it out, but you matter and you're important. And, you know, these are people that are staying up through the night at times and, working, you know, doubles and triples yeah. to put the needs of others in front of them. And so if you are a nurse or medical professional of any sorts, thank you. It's a big deal. Yeah, for sure. Such an important time and you matter. Is that the end of the episode? No. Okay. <laughs>
He's taking a coffee break, everybody. Hold on. <laughs> Just give him a minute. No, I, I think, I mean, the silence is to, to let it sink in. You know what I mean? Just the gravity of how serious the work is. I mean, they literally are saving lives every day. My friend, I almost said his name and we're just keeping... After all that. Yeah. <laughs> ah, Gilman, edit this. Um, getting back to, because I, I woke up this morning, I had a 7.30 uh, coffee appointment and I wanted to honor it. Uh, so I got home late, really didn't didn't sleep so so much, Yeah, which is funny in light of just doing an episode on sleep. I know. Um, but wanted to honor the, the 730 and I was meeting with an artist and he uh, recently has been married to another artist. Mm -hmm. And we were just talking about, you know, I was asking them what they were doing and what they wanted to do in light of being married and all of this new direction. And he was talking about his wife, uh, which today is her birthday. <gasps> Happy birthday, wife. Happy birthday, wife. And uh, we, I was just saying like, you know, if I were you, Here's what, here's what I would do. Um, if you can afford to invest in your art, uh, then that's what you need to do and, and, and push to see if you can make a living out of creating art and then selling it. And it, it's funny because it comes on the heels of my conversation late last night with my friend who now wants to, to start a side hustle. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think that it's harder than it is, uh, you know, starting your own, your own business or a side hustle to finance your future. I think that's very true. Even just saying that it sounds like a lot of work to me. Well, and I've been very close with people who have done it. So I know it's possible. It, it's but starting anything. I mean, starting is hard period. For sure. A and I mean, Malcolm Gladwell, 10,000 hours typically is what it's going to take. Uh, for you to invest in your craft and get it to a place where if you really have the goods and you have the ability to create things that, that other people want to pay for, um, it's going to take time yeah. for, for you to hone in on what, what people want. And we hear stories here and there about uh, people that just create something quick and it resonates and they take off, but it is, it is few and far between. Yeah. And a lot of those people tend to be one hit wonders in that they never create anything as popular again because the stars just kind of aligned for mm -hmm. them, mm -hmm. you know, and there, there's some luck involved there. But often if you create something great, uh, you have to have the character and the experience behind the idea to keep it going. Yeah. Um, I have a tremendous amount of respect for people that can continue to win because it's one thing to put a team together and, and you win. It's another thing to build a tradition of winning Yeah. because the tradition of winning can only come from, you know, a lot of decisions that, that keep the train on the tracks. And so if you're an entrepreneur or an artist, the real battle is not coming up with the right product. The, the real battle is all of the character and the competence underneath what it took to discover what people were willing to pay for so you can recreate that magic. Okay. So when you say winning and like, it sounds like you're talking about kind of a culture of winning. What, what yeah. is, what is, what's winning? Can well, tell me what the objective is and you're accomplishing it. You know, I, I use that analogy just with sports, right? So let's take uh, the new new England Patriots, whether you <sighs> love them or hate them. How about the Chicago Bulls in the nineties? That's a good one too. We can go with that one. Thanks. Uh, they built a culture of winning. Yeah. And, and so for them, uh, what it came down to was you had a certain amount of minutes within a certain amount of space that was taped off and, and called inbounds or out of bounds with a cylinder that you were to put a rubber ball or leather ball through more times than your opponent. Mm -hmm. And for them, that, that was winning. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that you got through all of your games and, and made it through the playoffs and had more baskets, i.e. points, than the other team when the clock ran out. Uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a favorite quote of mine from Michael Jordan where he says that he never lost. 
he just ran out of time. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard that He's or not. So good. Yeah, I mean that, but that was his mentality. Yeah, and he wasn't kidding. Yeah, he just ran out of time. Yeah, right. And so when you look at that, they were accomplishing their objectives. But but here's the deal. That's just what we saw. There there was so much underneath and behind the scenes, you know, with the Last Dance documentary that came out this year. Yeah, it's so good uh, about the Bulls. What a bright spot in the year. Well, yeah, and, and, and it helped that when they released it after working on it for 10 years right. that the large majority of the American public was trapped in their homes. We were all quarantined. Yeah. Yep. You had to watch it whether you wanted but, to or but, not. But those, those 10, right, episodes uh-huh. were showing you all of the hard work that went into having more uh, points that came from putting a leather ball in a cylinder. And that, that was just the, the criteria for winning for them. Yeah. Um, you know, that the the podcast that you and I were on recently, they asked us the definition, what's your definition of success? Mm -hmm. And that really comes down to, you know, tell me where you're at and what your goals are and I'll tell you what your success is. I answered that, that it's about being uh, present wherever I am and being content with whatever I'm dealing with. So as an entrepreneur, um, I mean, it, I hate to say, I would like it to be a little bit more like flowery, but I feel like the goal is to be able to live off of what you want to do. Like, I don't want it to just be about money, but it's kind of can't, that has to be part of success in this realm. Am I, I'm, I'm open to being wrong (laughs) in this, in this instance. Thank you for saying that. Wow. (laughs) Only took 34 (laughs) episodes to get here to where Mal was open to being wrong. But I mean, you what you're saying is first, great, like it's being present and all of that. But these people that you're talking to, they want to live, they want to make a living off of their passions. Sure. And that takes some, some I mean, you have to be able to put food on your table. Yeah. It, but, but here's the deal in, in what a lot of people don't understand. In, in most cases, you're going to have to have your regular job that pays and br- brings money in to pay your bills while you finance your future as an artist. How are you financing financing your future as an artist? You're learning. You're putting yourself, by definition, an entrepreneur takes on more risk than the average person to provide a living for themselves or for others. That That's the definition of an entrepreneur. The way I finance my future, right? And, and the word future there is important, is I work a job now that allows me to pay my bills, which means I need to figure out a way to keep my bills as low as possible so that I don't have to work as much in the job that is paying my bills. Mm -hmm. So I have more time to focus on my craft because if I have to get to that eight to 12,000 hours of investment, the more time I have, the faster I get there. Right. As that entrepreneur, it really comes back to like, you've got to understand it's a mindset that that's your investment. I'm working extra hours and and bringing in enough money to pay my bills to give myself enough time to develop a mindset that allows me to discover a process that can be repeated when it comes to creating whatever I'm going to create that people are willing to pay me for. And, And so, you know, at the end of the day, you've got to have a life that other people want to be a part of. We talk about that all the time. Mm-hmm. As an entrepreneur, you're taking the next step to say, how do I capitalize on this life, this substance, this worth, sense of worth that I have as a person and turn that into a product that will make a little bit of impact in another person's life to the extent that they want to pay me for it. And, and, and that's one of the things Uh, that's beautiful about capitalism is it gives people the opportunity to go out there and say, I think this is something that others want. Uh, Some of the fallacies about being an entrepreneur and starting your own business. I can't tell you how many, I'm an optimist. You know that. Yes. Right. Aware. And I used to think that because it was new to me, it was new to everybody else. Sure. And you will learn really quick as an entrepreneur that just, I mean, I have spent 
tens of thousands of dollars on ideas only to learn that it was new to me and it was not new to a lot of people. Right. Uh, I've spent tens of thousands of dollars jumping into an idea that was actually a world in and of itself that has hundreds of thousands of people participating in that world. Just because I was foreign to that world doesn't mean that that world did not exist. Right. Um, super side note, really weird, but I think this is true. I think we'll eventually realize that there were life on other planets totally existing outside of us that we were oblivious to because we were so consumed by our own world. That stuff happens when it comes to ecosystems for entrepreneurs and, and products. Uh, you dive into like social media or coding or i mean it, it, it can be anything and you'll find out that there are in a lot of cases hundreds of thousands of people that have been giving a lot more time and attention even their life to these topics and it's new to you but it's not new to them they've been doing it for a while okay so you're deflating everybody what no uh, i'm not yes. i'm encouraging everybody listen here's That's the deal not encouraging you need to Turn it up a notch in the encouragement. No, let, let, let me bring it back to a razor's edge as to why this is important. It's that stinking mindset of yours. You're buying yourself time to sharpen your mindset to figure out what is from what's not. And a lot of people, I, I see it every single week, a lot of people think that they have a great idea that people will pay them for. And they invest a lot of their time and a lot of their money and they get to the end and no one is willing to pay them for it. Now, is it a complete waste? Absolutely not. Because you know what you just did? You paid for an extended education. You just learned that you thought you had something great and nobody is interested in it. And so guess what? That means you struck out that time. It also means that you get to get back up again and in getting back up again, you're going to have a chance to swing again. And as I get more at bats, I hopefully get closer and closer to connecting with an idea that other people want to want to buy or want to want to be a part of. Uh, you know, I'll give you an example with um, with the restaurant with Table 33. I can remember thinking about this as far back as 2011. We started in 2015 and opened in 2017 uh, and, or 2016. I, I literally thought because there were no breakfast joints downtown that if we built a, a locally sourced breakfast place, people would be knocking down our door to get in. Mm -hmm. Not the case. Mm -hmm. Not the case. Uh and, and so there's a heck of a learning curve there. Now, when I go to evaluate other business opportunities, you better believe that I have a better competence of what's going to work and what's not going to work. Sure. The people that I want to talk to are, are the people that literally have spent, in some cases, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of dollars, sharpening their edge to figure out what's going to work and what's not going to work. Yeah. Because it's very easy to let your excitement convince you that because it's new to you, it's new to everyone. And, and then you get into the idea that it might be new to you and to everyone. But if you don't have the means to, to move it quick enough to market, right. somebody else will take it from you. Uh, I, I, I could give you a, a thousand examples. I spent $8,000 back in 2000 and like six, 2007, maybe, uh, developing a golf glove that had a, uh, accelerometer and gyroscope in the back of the glove so that when you swung, uh, based on that accelerometer and gyroscope, you would know where your ball went. And then you'd be able to play this round of golf and know exactly where all of your shots went. So then you could start running data and, and different analytics to see where your misses were, you know, when you were under pressure on par threes, you know, fairway shots, all of these things. Uh, halfway through the project, we, we were trying to to buy, um, we were trying to buy a website that that eventually got uh, acquired and is now called Golf Now. 
Uh, but prior to that, it was something else, and we were trying to buy it while developing this tech. And and Amy and I were uh, down in South Carolina on uh, at at a wedding, and I'll never forget. Uh, Nintendo came out and announced the Nintendo Wii. Oh yeah! And in their controls were an accelerometer and a gyroscope. And at that point in time, I had a decision to make: uh, Do I keep going, or is this already out there to the extent that I'm going to get lapsed and it's not worth my time? Right. Now I don't know that I made the right decision. You know, I had eight thousand dollars in it, and that was a crazy amount of money f- for us at the time. And I I aborted. I I abandoned. Uh, I jumped ship. Uh, and later people came out with golf gloves and all kinds sure. of things doing this very thing. But the point is I got an education there and it was expensive and I did not finish that project, but I learned something about the timing of everything and, and what, uh, not only what kind of idea you have to have to take to market, but what is the timing of that? Because there are companies out there like Facebook, uh, that if they like your idea, the quickest thing they're going to do is come and offer to buy you. Mm -hmm. If you don't, they're going to buy something else close to you and make it like you and put you out of business, i.e. Snapchat, right? They came to to Snapchat and said, Hey, we really like you guys. We're going to offer you 300 billion or I I mean, it was a crazy number like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And they said, Nope, sorry. We've got a good thing here. You can go whatever. Right. And so what, what does Facebook do? They acquire Instagram and start making stories for themselves. Yeah. And so there's a timing factor to it as well that you, you're you just, you have your day job to give you enough money to pay your bills and then you take your passion and you understand that it's going to take you about 10 years to 10,000 hours to really figure out the razor edge of what people are willing to pay for. And in some cases, you know, you don't get to a place where people are willing to spend a lot of money on your books or your art or your music sure. uh, or your building projects or the homes you're building. Maybe you never get there. Well, and that's why I think it's so important to enjoy. I mean, it sounds lame, but to enjoy the journey. Of well, and, and that's what I was going to come back and say, like, what is the reward that you're still pursuing your passion yeah. and you're learning a lot as you do that, yeah. that you're, that you're pursuing your passion and, you know, there are some ways to, to make that easier. Like make sure that your, your eight to five is bringing you pleasure and that you can be passionate about it. Mm -hmm. But, but one of the real ways to finance your future is diving in and realizing that you're going to have to take a period of time to grow your competence when it comes to, uh, figuring out the process of creating things in a timely manner that people are willing to pay for. And I'm still learning that. I mean, I've started over 50 organizations. Uh, I've, you know, gone through the patent process, you know, indoor training facilities. I mean, all kinds of things. And all it's doing, in my opinion, those are more at bats. I'm just getting up to bat more and more and more. And so when people talk to me about business or ask me my opinion, I'm just telling, often I can tell them what's not going to work. And I think what happens is if you can get enough things on your plate as to what doesn't work, you eventually hone in on what does work. What are, what are all of the characteristics of something that does work? So right now this is sounding like, well, I still think it's a little overwhelming and kind of lonely, the process. Sure. It's very lonely. Um, That's why you're taking on more risk. That's why you're called an entrepreneur. But like even people who, who $8,000 is a lot of money to a lot of people. Um, and maybe they can't even begin there. Like I guess I just, I, I need more practical advice. (laughs) I hear everything you're saying and I think it's great. And can you like break it down just one more level? We're talking about any sort of craft. Sure. Right. And so, um, a, pa- a painter or something like wh- where do, I, I don't, I feel like I, I need a little bit more to hold on to. Well, I, I, I think what you're addressing is the part of the process that is extremely natural that questions or tests 
the authenticity and integrity of your intentions. Like th there's something built into the process that literally um, forces you to figure out why you're doing what you're doing. And the people that quit and give up and go on to the next thing are people that were primarily doing it to have less um, people talking into their life or telling them where they need to be when, or they were chasing money. And there is something about the economy of being an entrepreneur that tests the integrity of your intentions and, and what gets rewarded. What often gets rewarded are the people that have the staying power that comes from it being driven by it being a passion versus an attempt to make money. That's great. That's what I needed. Thank you. It, I mean, it's real. And, and I mean, so many people give up because entrepreneurship is not a replacement um, for, for lack or a gap in your life. It, it can't be just the next thing mm -hmm. for you. Mm -hmm. it, it's like getting married. You don't get married to get, to get happy. Right. It, it, if you're getting married because you think it's going to make you happy. Oh boy. Oh buddy. Oh boy. Yeah. And, and so it, if you want to become an entrepreneur or have a side hustle because you think that's going to make you happy or wealthy, what history tells me and I think it's more than just me is the authenticity or integrity of your intentions isn't going to be enough to keep you. Okay. So what's like a little, um, I feel like such a cheerleader today, but like, what's a little something that you hold on to as you're going and it starts to get really hard or lonely, or you need to remind yourself yeah. of why you're doing what you're doing. Angry birds. Okay. Angry birds. We heard you the first time. Can you expand? <laughs> I tried to do that with as much drama as I could. Oh, I know. I know. That was good. It was very dramatic. We're all on the edge of our seat. Who's Kiefer Sutherland's father? You know, he was in uh, Italian Job. What? The movie. I know the movie. I'm, Hold I on, think let I'm, me get the Google out. I, I think I'm right on this one. I just channeled Kiefer Sutherland's father. Oh, oh, Donald. Donald. Donald Sutherland. Yes, I, I know him. I, I just channeled when I, when I said Angry Birds. <laughs> I was I was I was seeing him. I did not in know my mind. that that was his dad. Fascinating. Yes. Okay. Um, Angry Birds. It, it was their 51st or 50. That group, the, the group that created Angry Birds, that is now books and movies and t-shirts that all came from that app. It was their 51st or 52nd app that they created. The 50 before that failed. And so the truth of the matter is, why did they keep going? Why were they obsessed with this? Because they had a, pa they had a passion. That's a really interesting speaking of energy. I was thinking about that friend earlier and now he's calling me. He's out in California. Okay. Sorry. Still had the phone hooked very up from last he's call. He's also very much in my ear right now. Not anymore. Okay. But, but, but something like Angry Birds where yeah. their passion for what they were doing kept them. And, it, and it's just like the truth of the matter is if you're going to, to bring a product to market or create something that a lot of people want to, to be a part of or, or have it, it is impregnated with blood, sweat and tears and not giving up. Yeah. And, and you know, a whole other episode would be getting into the idea of entrepreneurs and inside that 10,000 hours learn to constantly reinvent themselves. That, that if you're out there and you're thinking about starting a side hustle or, or being an entrepreneur, let me just tell you that part of your competence that you're going to learn in these 10,000 hours is the world is still spinning and people are still evolving and, and your artwork and your hustle is constantly evolving Yeah, and you have to be, and, and again, this is something that you learn. You have to be willing to evolve. Well, I didn't want to do that. 
I, I just want to, I want to create one thing and have it pay me so I can retire. Mm. Well, that, that's a mentality that will change as you get on the journey. Sure. Because that's never going to make you happy. Yeah. You create one thing that works, you want to create another. And so at the end of the day, what's beautiful about it is you're handling, whether it's your mind or your hands, you're handling the process of how life evolves and how you create things out of your experience that positively impact the lives of others. Is it worth it? 100%. Uh, do you need to be me or another entrepreneur? No. You need to figure out you and you need to pursue your passions. If you try to pursue another person's passions, in most cases, it's not going to go well for you. Yeah. Episode 34, Emotionships, where we talk about the real reason everything happens for a reason. Uh, Mal's out. <laughs> the headset's hurting me today. The headset hurts. Until next time.